banding together and calling for an investigation. Three of them just wrapped up a news conference here in New York City demanding he be held accountable. Earlier, they appeared on Megyn Kelly today saying they want the truth to come out. He comes in like he owns the place and like he owns you and is just looking at us, eyeing us up and down, and then walked into the dressing room where we have two big security guards to make sure nobody but the girls and our female chaperones can get into the dressing room, and he just walks right in. And on one day, I decided to introduce myself because I did see him regularly, um, and he shook my hand, you know, and he kind of gave me the normal double cheek kiss, um, but then he held on to my hand, and he kept kissing me. You know, he kept asking me maybe a, a question, where are you from, and kissing me again. Where is and this? Again. Where is this happening? It's right outside the elevators, right outside my office. So he kept kissing you? Yeah. He went, I don't know how many times back and forth, multiple, um, and then he kissed me on the lips. All of a sudden, he's all over me, kissing and groping and groping and kissing. I do remember at one point out of my side eye thinking of well, that guy sitting across the aisle, why doesn't he come to my defense? Where's the stewardess? You know, somebody. But then when his hand started going up my skirt, I'm not a small person. I managed to wiggle out and stand up, grab my purse, and I went to the back of the airplane. That's a lot to take in. In a statement issued during the program, the White House said, quote, these false claims, totally disputed in most cases by eyewitness accounts, were addressed at length during last year's campaign, and the American people voiced their judgment by delivering a decisive victory. The timing and absurdity of these false claims speaks volumes, and the publicity tour that has begun only further confirms the political motives behind them. President Trump is making, while this is all happening, a last-minute pitch for Alabama Senate candidate Roy Moore who is accused, of course, of sexual misconduct with teenage girls. Here's Trump's urgent message to Alabama voters in a form of a robocall. Roy is a conservative who helped me steer this country back on track after eight years of the Obama disaster. Get out and vote for Roy Moore. His vote is our Republican Senate, and it's needed. Remember, it was Mitch McConnell who said he believes the women, as did Ivanka Trump. Well, all of this comes as one of the women who claims she dated Roy Moore when she was a teenager speaks out in her first broadcast interview. Debbie Wesson Gibson tells NBC News Moore is unfit for office. I would encourage people, however, to ask themselves, do you want a man who lies now, however old he, however old he is in 2017, I'm telling you now, he's currently a liar. He lied directly about me on November 27th and November 29th, and I can vouch for that. He is unfit for public service in, at the Senate level in this nation. I want to bring in my guest on this one, NBC's Vaughn Hilliard, covering the race in Midland City, Alabama. His basically his new home, Noel Nickpour, a Republican strategist, and Peter Weiner, a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and he has served in both the Reagan and Bush and both Bush administrations. Vaughn, I want to start with you. Roy Moore has been out of the spotlight, and we're hearing not just President Trump, but there are other big names coming out against Roy Moore with their own robocalls. Yeah, we, we're just coming into NBC News, Stephanie. We're finding out that uh, from Doug Jones campaign officials that they expect to be start sending out phone robocalls into Alabama homes starting this evening with the likes of President Obama and Joe Biden, both of them making their own separate pitches on behalf of the Democrat running here in the state. Again, we expect those calls to start going into Alabama homes tonight. The campaign is also running, though, robocalls with the voice of uh, uh, Alabama's other senator, Republican Richard Schell. Shelby, who in an interview yesterday reminded people that he did not vote for Roy Moore, the Republican, who would be seated next to him in the U.S. Congress. And instead, he said that he voted in and wrote in the name of a, another distinguished Republican, as he called it. Uh, so this is a campaign, right? You're looking at Doug Jones, who has a field operation. They've been out making phone calls, have been out canvassing. This is a candidate who was in Selma, Montgomery, Birmingham on Saturday, and Huntsville yesterday, meeting with staffers, meeting with field volunteers who have a full, robust operation in play. Compare that to Roy Moore, who has not been seen in more than a week. We are here in Midland City, where he will be appearing alongside former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon. But the, the, the distinction between these two campaign operations, just 24 out, uh, hours out, couldn't be more distinct at this point, Stephanie. 
Peter, I want you to help us understand Alabama and the evangelical vote, because we've heard from many Roy Moore supporters that Washington and the rest of the country is insulting them, and we don't understand who they are. Now, Vice News spoke to a focus group of Roy Moore voters, and I want to share what one of them said about the allegations against him. Forty years ago in Alabama, uh, people could get married yeah. at 13 and 14 years old. My grandmother at 13 was married, at 15 had two children and a husband and a job. If Roy Moore was guilty, if, if he was at the mall hitting on this 14-year-old, 40 years ago in Alabama, there's a lot of mamas and daddies that'd be thrilled that their 14-year-old was getting hit on by a district attorney. All right, so Peter, take me to Alabama. I mean, that's, that's an argument that's hard for me to listen to, but maybe that's their truth. Well, whether it's their truth or not doesn't matter. There's objective truth, and that's a violation of it. It's disgraceful and disgusting, whether it happens in Alabama or any other state. Uh, this is just impossible to make sense of, except, I suppose, in, uh, unless you accept certain propositions, which is what social scientists refer to as confirmation bias or motivated reasoning. That is that these people have a certain view of Roy Moore or in the case of Donald Trump and they hold to it and no facts will enter in uh, that, that, uh, that will dispute that. They are hermetically sealed off and they simply cannot process views that go contrary to what they believe. But this is really, really dangerous in a democracy because finally you have to have some kind of common understanding of um, of, of truth, but it is extraordinary, uh, I will say, as someone who is of the Christian faith, to see the kind of support uh, for Donald Trump broadly among evangelicals in the country and in Alabama for Roy Moore. Uh, this is, you know, Nietzsche had a phrase of transvaluation of values, the inversion of values, and here you have people whose lives are supposedly committed to uh, Christ, to be followers of Jesus, and to see the way that these uh, two guys treat people, treat women, in such a predatory and dehumanizing way, and to defend him and to stand up uh, on behalf of, of them is just um, really sickening. On the sickening front, Noel, I have to ask you, you're a Republican. You go out there, you raise money uh, on a regular basis uh, for the GOP, and you know that the RNC at this point is continuing to back Roy Moore. And one thing that stood out when I watched that Vice video, there was one woman who said after Roy Moore wins, he will be vindicated. His accusers will be shown to be liars just like President Trump's were. Here's what's stunning to me. All right. President Trump's weren't shown to be liars. And you can even put President Trump's 16 accusers, three of who spoke to Megyn Kelly earlier, they're having a press conference now, or think about President Trump's own words. That access Hollywood tape, that was his words. Right. He went on at the, at the Miss Teen USA pageant or the other uh, teen pageant that he owned, bragging about going backstage. He can go back there. They're undressed because he, he owns the place. Mm -hmm. So how is it that you've got Trump voters that still say, well, those accusers, they were liars. He never did it. It's called a loyal base. Do you remember when he was giving a speech and he said he could walk out in Manhattan and, and shoot a gun and he would still have favorable ratings? It has something to do with a Teflon brand, that they can pretty much do anything. Look at Bill Clinton. He was accused of, of all sorts of things. And today, he is looked at as one of the key endorsements when somebody is running for political office. John Edwards, that wasn't the case. You know, there are a lot of people that they, they have a mishap like this, and they are not, uh, they don't have a favorable brand. Roy Moore is, is, is this is a huge, this is a bad representation for the GOP. Uh, in, in more ways than one, because what I don't like about Roy Moore as compared to Donald Trump is the fact that he is hiding behind religion. He is cheapening religion. He is hiding behind almost like he is a persecuted Christian and they're coming at him. This is wrong to do. And if he was a true public servant, he would step aside and let the good voters of Alabama ha have s some other choice rather than putting, uh, you know, a platform ahead of, of him out there seeking his own personal, personal ways. It's really hard. I want to stay on religion because, Peter, you have said you can no longer call yourself an evangelical Republican. Is the word Republican what has changed 
or evangelical because many of these evangelical Christians are willing to see past what President Trump has done or what Roy Moore has done because for them they're single issue voters and they look at the confirmation of Neil Gorsuch or the 58 mostly white male uh, judges and U.S. attorneys who have been appointed and that matters more to them. So for you to no longer be an evangelical Republican, what's the issue? Where's the issue? Well, it's both, actually. It's uh, the Republican Party and the term evangelical. Um, and I should underscore that it doesn't mean that I'm not a conservative or a Christian. That's not what I'm renouncing. In fact, quite the opposite, because I think the Republican Party under uh, Donald Trump is at war with much of conservatism. And I think the term evangelical and the way it's being represented in the public square by a lot of the evangelical leaders is doing great harm to that term and really to, to, to the witness of um, of, uh, of Christians. That doesn't mean that there aren't lots of people who are admirable who are Republicans and evangelicals. I know a lot of them. But at some point, you reach a tipping point, and there are certain bridges that are too far. And Donald Trump and Roy Moore and Steve Bannon are becoming uh, the public face of the Republican Party. And the strongest base of support for, for Trump uh, and for Moore in Alabama are self-described evangelicals. Now, I understand the argument that they make, which is that they think that those policies will do more to advance the good of the country. But there reaches a point where that, that no longer applies. And beyond that, the enthusiastic support that you, that you see, particularly among a lot of evangelical leaders for, for Trump, they won't hold him accountable. They go sort of oche. Uh, or, or, they, or they champion him, they'll, they'll never um, criticize him. And so I just feel like those terms, which are important to me, these are institutions that I've been a part of my entire adult life, I feel like they're being stained and, and degraded. And at least I personally felt like I needed to, uh, to back away. Then, Noel, what do you say, what do you do with the younger generation of Republicans or evangelicals? You know, one could say, you didn't know Alabama 40 years ago. It was a different place, a different lifestyle. But we know that the head of the Young Republicans for Alabama, she said, this is about decency, not politics. Yeah. I, I can't support Roy Moore. But again, you've got the RNC supporting it. So yeah. what does this do for the younger faction of Republicans? You know what? Uh, your previous uh, comment on what the uh, Alabama uh, GOP person said, that's where it's at. That's right on. Millennials are not going to let this happen. They're a g different generation, and the old guard, the same old, same old, that's not going to work, and that's not going to fly. What the RNC is doing, uh, you know, hook, line, and sinker, following through and, and releasing money and funding that race just because they want to have a Republican in office, that's not right. That's not good. That doesn't send a message to women that this is a party that they want to join. We already have a problem with, you know, attracting women and minorities within the party. This is the last thing they needed to do. While we're raising more money than we ever have because we've got the great Steve Wynn as our finance chairman, which is fantastic. This is not a good message. I think this is one of the worst examples uh, of fighting for a Republican that I've ever seen. And we would have never had this problem if Steve Bannon didn't get in the middle of a red state. This would have gone Republican. This would have gone Luther Strange. And the president supported Luther Strange. We would have never had this if Steve Bannon didn't feel the need to go ahead and disrupt the primary and look what we have now. And by the way, if Doug Jones wants a really winning ticket, all he has to do is say, you know what? I woke up. I'm now pro-life. Boom. Look at all these people that now have another choice. Wow. All right, Peter, before we go then, Noel makes a lot of good points. This message doesn't work with millennials. We won't stand for this. This isn't the future. Those are all great arguments. But do they hold any water if Roy Moore wins tomorrow, Peter? Yeah, in fact, I think those arguments get more salient if Roy Moore wins, because then he's got a position, a public position, uh, for presumably six, six years, which he wouldn't have if, if he lost. I think she's quite right. I think that the, the millennial challenge, both for Republicans and for evangelicals, is very pronounced. The polling data indicates that. They're just deeply uncomfortable with people like uh, Trump and Moore and what they represent. They're looking for something better and higher and deeper, and they're not getting it from the Republican Party. And in fact, they're getting the opposite. They may, uh, you know, the Republicans uh, may win uh, tomorrow in Alabama, uh, and Trump may be president, but their long term prospects are not good. There's a line in The Man for All Seasons where Thomas Moore says to Richard Rich when he betrays him, 